Einstein's general theory of relativity. Let's have a look at that. He connected energy and mass in an exact mathematical equation. Very, very well known. E equals mc squared. E stands for energy. C stands for the mass of whatever. And C is the speed of light, which is a large number. And if you square it, it becomes even larger. So if you take a mass, look at me quickly, if you take a mass and you could somehow destroy it and convert it into energy, you, that equation says to you that you are going to get a heck of a lot of energy out of it. Called a nuclear bomb. That's where the energy comes from, for a nuclear bomb out of this equation. Mass is destroyed in a nuclear bomb which becomes energy and lots of energy. But he also had a second equation which he has on the blackboard there for you and that connects space and mass into one exact equation and now we don't talk about space anymore, we don't talk about time anymore, we talk about space-time. Because space and time are reversible into one another. I hope you're all aware that Einstein had two theories of relativity. His theory of special relativity and his theory of general relativity. Special relativity deals only with speed or velocity. General re relativity deals with not only speed or velocity, but with acceleration and deceleration as well. And Einstein found out that mass warps space. And he found out that what Newton thought was a force, which he called F, was not really a force. The Earth and the Sun stick together, not because they attract one another by gravitational attraction. The Earth sticks to the Sun because the mass of the Sun is so huge that it warps space through which Earth moves in such a way that it runs around the Sun all the time. And that gift gives you an indication of what that means. Space is so warp around the sun that Earth runs in that warp. And that's why Earth does what it does. And space determines how mass will move. And we call that gravity. And we always say that's a force of attraction. Einstein said no, it's because of the warpedness of space that it happens. Gravity is the result of how space gets warped by mass. This represents the fabric of the universe. Einstein said, that's how God made it. He just found out what he did. <laughs> in 4D land, time does exist in the form of a mere spatial or length axis. Listen carefully. But passage of time, takes for loop, as we know it, does not exist. In 4D, passage of time presents as successive spaces with distances in between. And now it becomes difficult to conceptualize. <laughs> now you've got to think, I know it's getting late, but please keep up your wits. Cause and effect, and the scientific term for that is causality. Cause and effect do not exist in four dimensions. Nothing ever causes anything else to happen since there is no passage of time. Look at me quickly. In our natural world, where we have passage of time, we can say event A causes event B. And by saying that, we presuppose that between event A and event B, there was passage of time. If there was no passage of time between the two, we can hardly say that A caused B. Right? 
So if you are in four dimensions and you stand still, you don't walk to the future and you don't walk to the, to the past, you stand still, then whatever you experience there, there is no causality because there is no passage of time because you haven't moved. So you can hardly say that event A caused event B because there was no passage of time in between. So causality becomes non-existent. Undefined. You cannot say one thing caused another. According to Einstein, the third dimension possesses a particular fabric. Space, time, mass and energy are woven into dynamic processes with each other which can be described by exact mathematical equations. And that's what Einstein did. And as we will later see, mass or matter, as we know it, can only exist in the third dimension. Hence, gravity as we know it does not exist in the fourth dimension. For gravity to exist, you need mass. Do you agree? Because that's part of Newton's equation. You have one mass and another mass. So if there is no mass, you can't have gravity. Because the equation becomes naught on both sides. Do you agree? It would therefore make sense to assume that the fabric of other dimensions would be intrinsically different to those we are familiar with here on our home ground in the third dimension. Look at me quickly. We have a set of laws here in the third dimension that we are quite familiar with, most of us. We are very familiar with gravity, we are very familiar with thermodynamics, we are very familiar with electromagnetism and all of that. All those are described by very exact mathematical and physical equations. But in other dimensions, if you could live there, a whole new set of laws would appear. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the fourth dimension, there is no mass. There is no gravity. If gravity is not there, how does it work? What sticks together? How do you walk on the four-dimensional Earth? You will walk and you will drift away. <laughs> you can't stay on, on that Earth. Right. The laws of nature would most probably act completely different, and Newton's three laws of motion and law of gravity, Maxwell's three laws of electromagnetism, and the three laws of thermodynamics, and all other local laws of nature would be invalid and irrelevant. According to Einstein's theory of general relativity, and most of us are familiar with this, the speed of light in a vacuum always stays constant for every point of observation, 2,99 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Very, very fast. Neither matter nor any wave can move faster than light in a vacuum. That's the ultimate speed. Number three, the mass of any object accelerated by any force except gravity unto high speed initially increases almost imperceptibly but eventually dramatically. Can I emphasize that? The moment you start to accelerate and you get close to the speed of light, Einstein's equation says that you become very, very heavy. When you're as slow as we are normally, it's almost imperceptible. The graph is an ex exponential graph. In, in the beginning, it's very slow. But as you approach the speed of light, your mass starts to increase very, very fast. So fast that even if you would take something as small and as light as an electron, very, very small, very, very light, and you would increase it to the speed of light. You would never have enough energy to get to that last decimal to get to the speed of light. Why? Because the electron gets so heavy. <laughs> so heavy that you can't get enough energy together to accelerate it anymore. That's why. Which means that if you can't do it to, with an electron, which is one of the basic particles of matter, how can you do it with any kind of matter? How can you do it with a body like ours? Never! Hence, matter can never exist in the fourth dimension. Can't get there. It's too heavy. 
Are you, are you happy with what I'm saying? So you and I can forget about our uh, aspirations to go to the fourth dimension and uh, look around there. Not as a body. Not with your body. The only way you will ever get there, look at me quickly, is when you're disembodied. What does that mean? Your spirit might be able to do it. For any object moving at a very high speed, time slows down. Aging, for example, slows down. As soon as the speed of light is reached, listen carefully, time comes to a standstill. Then everything happens at once. <laughs> Look at me quickly. It's very difficult for our minds this thing of time. Because we're so used to time proceeding at 24 hours a day. Constant for millennia it's done that. So it's, we think time has always been like that and will always be like that. It's just going to go on and on and on and on at the same rate. Einstein differs. He says, if you can move quick enough, fast enough, time will slow down for you. So much so that you will age slower. In other words, if you can loop through the universe, you pull away air from Earth and you loop through the universe and you come back, you will say to yourself, it's one day, I've been away for a journey of one day. And when you get back to Earth, what do you find? All the people you've known are long dead. What have you done? You've traveled into the future. That was you. Know. Feeling to you as only one day. But if you stayed at the snail speed of Earth, it would have been many, many years. Even our astronauts today, when they go to the International Space Station, which goes around the Earth quite fast, not, not nearly as by the speed of light, but much faster than we move, they age slower. Not much, it's a few seconds when they come back, the difference, but they can measure it today. And you know what happens to those astronauts when they get back here? Some of them land up in the practices of psychologists. Mm -hmm. Because what they experience is that time is going not forward for them when they're back here, but backwards. Real experience today of astronauts. Because now they've got to get back to the Earth time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they experience that time's going backwards and it's a very very weird thing to them and they they think they're going crazy mm. it is practically impossible though to accelerate any object even an item as tiny and light as an electron unto the speed of light as its speed increases the electron would get so heavy that it would require huge amounts of energy to accelerate it any further mass and therefore matter cannot exist in the fourth dimension. Mass simply cannot move fast enough. Hence, anything or any body aspiring to reach the fourth dimension or exist in it must be disembodied. For example, something resembling a human spirit, which is non-material, like angels, demons, God, spirit beings like elves, leprechauns, nerds, etc. Look at me. Oh, nami nami. Oh, the tokolos. Oh, mermaids and mermen. And those things. All made by God. Not mentioned in the Bible. But very, very real. I've done enough deliverance work in my life to know they are very, very real. 
but existing in the spirit world. If anything non-material would move at or beyond the speed of light, it would invade the fourth dimension, since that is the moment at which time comes to a standstill. The faster you go, the slower time proceeds, and when you get to the speed of light, time comes to a standstill and turns into a mere fourth length axis in our axis system. Any non-material object could orientate itself at will in relation to this axis, depending on how advanced its technology in the 4D world would be. Can he walk? Does he have a car? Does he have an aeroplane? That kind of thing. Matter, which possesses mass and occupies space, can therefore exist only in the third dimension. Listen carefully. Matter is simply too large for the second dimension. Matter occupies space. You can't fit yourself into flatland. You're too round. You're too big. You're too fat for flatland. You will never fit in there. Even an atom is too thick. An atom is very small, but is width is not zero, like that of a flatland. So matter cannot exist in the second dimension, neither can matter exist in the fourth dimension because it's too heavy. So matter can only exist in the third dimension where we are. That's the only place where you will ever find matter. The well-known time traveler paradox. According to this paradox, it is impossible to travel through time. We always see the sci-fi movies about time travel, don't we? The problem is the following. Suppose you'd be able to travel back to the past and arriving there, prevent your parents from ever meeting each other. You go to the past and you prevent your parents from meeting one another. Then you'd never have been born whilst you clearly exist. You've just prevented them from meeting one another. Mm -hmm. And that is a logical paradox. As soon as one grasps the above mentioned you realize that travelers through the fourth dimension must be disembodied and hence would be unable to exert any physical influence on their environment. We would most probably be mere spectators to whatever transpires. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The same would probably apply for the future. As travelers through the fourth dimension, we would most probably be mere spectators of whatever would unfold in the future. In order to physically change the future, we'd have to return to the present in the third dimension and be re-embodied. Look at me. That is why demons want to be embodied. Because from outside they can do very, very little. But as embodied beings, they can take part in the third dimension. The Big Bang. There's our solar system once again, the Milky Way as seen from the Earth once again, and the Milky Way as seen from space once again. During the early 1900s, mankind's knowledge of the universe was basically restricted to our own solar system and our own galaxy, the Milky Way. People, look at me quickly. Just a hundred years ago, that's Sumanawida. We didn't know about Andromeda or anything beyond that. We knew only about our own solar system, our sun in other words, and a few planets that are our neighbors here, and the stars in our Milky Way. That's what mankind knew about just 100 years ago. And I'm going to run with you through a bit of history, what happened in the past 100 years that had us know what we know today, so we can understand where our knowledge comes from. An American astronomer called Edwin Hubble changed all this. He realized that some of the stars he was observing through his telescope really proved to be entire remote galaxies. Mm -hmm. So what Galileo was looking at through his telescope, which was a weak telescope, he saw only one point of light through that telescope and he said to himself, that must be another star. Now that we have these huge telescopes that we have today, and even telescopes floating around in space, that thing's magnification is much better. And he pulls that dot apart. And you see it's not a dot. There are spaces in between. 
It's a lot of stars that was ju just clumped together. It's actually a whole galaxy. And it is far, far away, much further away than our galaxy's stars. That's what they all saw. And there's his picture. In 1929, Hubble noticed that every other galaxy seemed to be moving away from the Earth and that the most remote ones were traveling the fastest. So what was Hubble observing through his telescope? He was seeing that these things that lie outside of our galaxy, very, very far away, they all seem to be moving away from us and very fast away from us. And he said to himself, what's going on? Whichever direction I look, these things are moving away from us as if we are the center of everything. And he said to himself, that can't be. And then he realized, it's like a balloon. If you take a balloon, not inflated, you take a cocoa and you make spots on it, dots, black dots on it. And then you go and you inflate the balloon. If you could transform yourself into an ant and go and sit on any one of those dots and you look at the other dots, what will you see? You will see that all the other dots are moving away from you. Never mind which dot you sit on. Because everything is moving away from everything. Right? Now that is two-dimensional. It's on the surface of a balloon. But this whole thing is three-dimensional. It's, it's actually four. But anyway, everything is going away from I I everything else. And I will say that means only one thing. If they are moving away from one another, yesterday they must have been closer to one another. Last week they must have been closer to one another. A million years ago they must have been very close to one another. And they started to apply the laws of nature in backward fashion, sort of reversing the video of creation by the laws of nature and saying, where did it all start? And that's where the Big Bang Theory comes from. It must have all started at one point and started to move away from one another. And that moving away from they said that must have been a huge bang to do that. He inferred that the entire universe was expanding. Hubble and the Belgian physicist Georges Lemaitre later calculated the exact rate of this expansion. This then radically changed mankind's understanding of the universe. Honoring Hubble's pioneering work, the famous Hubble Space Telescope was named after him. And of course, hereafter, astronomers started asking this logical question. So, if the universe is expanding, where and when did this expansion start? So they started to apply the laws of nature in reverse mode. Newton's three laws of motion and law of gravity, Kepler's laws and many others, in order to play backwards the video of the universe's expansion. And today, after many decades, the general consensus among astronomers is that it all apparently started at a point, which they then called a singularity. That's the name they gave that point, without any space around it. Now just imagine this. It was not a point somewhere in space. The only thing that existed was a single zero dimensional point. There was no space around it. Because as this point exploded, it created the very space that we have today. Very difficult to conceptualize because if you look at the point, you look from somewhere, but there's no space for you to look from. <laughs> crammed into this point was everything that we can see around us today 13.8 billion years ago caused by the immeasurable tension inside this point it apparently exploded in at least four dimensions into all directions the so-called big bang during this immense explosion the entire content of this point was flung into space the very space that the explosion itself created as it expanded if we could depict this explosion in two dimensions on the graph, with time on the horizontal axis, it would look more or less like this. 
On the left hand side you see the Big Bang. Time is on the horizontal axis and as time traversed the Big Bang grew bigger and bigger and bigger. It looks like a trumpet. You will see that right at the beginning there was just a lot of dust. And by the gravitational pull that the masses of the dust had upon each other, it formed galaxies and stars. And the universe that we have today, at the right hand side of the, of the graph, of the trumpet. But very soon this new model of the universe ran into logical contradictions. The first major problem appeared when astronomers observed that the universe did not merely expand at a fixed rate, but that the rate of expansion was ever increasing. They didn't only see that everything was moving away from us very fast, it was going faster all the time. The rate at which they moved away was increasing. And we know that every such rate increase would require energy. Where would the universe be sourcing this energy from? The second major problem was that this increasing rate of expansion is apparently held back by a force of gravity which tends to make the universe contract, come together again. But insufficient matter or mass exists in the universe to cause such a huge contraction. Where then would this matter be hiding? Theoretical physicists then attempted to resolve these problems by postulating the existence of two phenomena that's never been observed before. What are they? Number one, dark energy. And number two, dark matter. It is estimated that up to 70% of the matter of the universe must consist of dark matter to cause what we see around us, what we observe. Matter which, until today, nobody in the world has ever observed. Why? Because it's dark. It doesn't emit light, so we can't see it. In 2015, the Planck spacecraft took a picture which proved the historicity of the Big Bang. I've got bad news for you who don't believe the Big Bang ever happened. There's been taken a picture of it already in 2015. <laughs> it did happen. How do we know that? From space, it took a 360 degree spherical picture, not only like that, everywhere from space. It took a 360 spherical picture of the microwave background emissions from the universe. These microwave background emissions are the 13.8 billion years old remnants of the cataclysmic effects of the Big Bang. If these emissions would prove to be strewn across the universe rather evenly, it would mean that suns and galaxies would have never developed as a result of the mutual gravity between the dust particles of the explosion. And if these emissions would prove to be uneven, they would offer us strong clues regarding the remote future of the universe. What is it all about? Let me explain quickly. If there's a big explosion, there's a lot of light emitting from it. Light travels at a very fast but finite 2.99 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Fast but finite. It can traverse only so much space in so much time. Okay? And since everything is moving away from us, that light shifts in the spectrum of electromagnetic waves. And those of you who have taken science at school will know that the electromagnetic uh, wave sits on a spectrum. It is the observable uh, light that we see. Left of that spectrum, we have unobservable uh, to the eye electromagnetic waves, and to the right of that spectrum, there's some more of the same. Because everything is moving away from us, the wavelengths are stretched. So the frequencies differ, differ, and the light of those times now falls in the microwave spectrum today, many, many years later. And that was what Planck was searching for, and he took a picture. And we must understand what we see when we see the picture. Before they saw the picture, the scientists said to one another, if that emissions are quite even, in other words, we have an even picture, of what is around us in terms of microwave uh, emissions, then we know it wasn't the Big Bang and that all our theories are wrong because an even picture would mean that the 
explosion was exactly symmetrical. And there was never, ever any clumps of dust that could attract one another. Everything just attracted one another from all sides. And suns would never have formed, galaxies would never have formed, the earth would never have formed, life would never occur, and so on and on. But they said, if it is uneven, if it's grainy, if the picture is like sand, it's grainy, then we know that these clumps existed and could form what we think it formed. Most people are familiar with the custom of cartographers to depict the spherical surface of the Earth on the flat pages of atlases as follows. Why, why am I putting this on? Because when we see the spacecraft picture, we must know what we're seeing. We must understand what we're seeing. This is a round thing, and we know that it's now flat there, and we know what the cartographer meant when he drew it like that, because he had to fit it into an atlas which has flat pages. That's why, right? This represents a flat version of a spherical object as seen from the outside. Do you agree? Yeah. Now you're going to see a picture of a spherical object seen from the inside, mm -hmm. portrayed in the same fashion. And that's the picture. This picture taken by the Planck spacecraft of microwave background emissions, represents a flat version of a spherical universe. That picture that he took right around everything that he could see, as seen from the inside. The Milky Way, which would have been in the way, had been omitted. The first striking feature of the picture is that it isn't uniform. It isn't even. even. It's grainy. Secondly, and this is the nail in the coffin. Galaxies ultimately did develop exactly in those spaces where the picture shows the most intense radiation in red on the picture. So we know we were right. And thirdly, the sizes of the spots in the picture offer astronomers a very significant indication of what would happen to our universe in the remote future. Very, very clever mathematics that apply there. There are three possible ways by which our universe could meet its ultimate end. Number one, the first possibility that could happen to our universe is it could continue to expand unrestrainedly and expand ever faster. This would mean that no more new stars or galaxies could be formed and that all our current stars would eventually end up very, very far from us. That's just logical. And when our sun had then used up all its hydrogen fuel and died, the Earth at first would become very, very hot. It's going to become a red star and it's going to expand. It's going to swallow the orbit of the Earth and eventually very, very cold. Then it becomes a white dwarf. If it had survived the heat, we would die lonely and cold, but fortunately only after millions of years. You don't have to sleep badly about this <laughs> because you will be long dead when this happens. This option is known as an open universe. The second option is this. The attracting forces of gravity could eventually cause the universe to stop expanding and to start to condense. This contraction would then accelerate, causing the universe to die in a big crunch. A big crunch is the opposite of a big bang. That means that everything that has expanded away from one another now contracts and it comes together again and it crunches into a singularity once again. This option is known as a closed universe. That was option two. Option three, gravity and expansion could remain in balance. Our universe could then continue to expand in a slow and controlled way. New stars and galaxies would continue to form. This option is known as a flat universe. From the size of the spots on the Planck spacecraft's picture, astronomers could infer that our universe happens to be a flat universe. 
<laughs> Very clever mathematics that they applied. And they realized that we live in a flat universe. So we are heading for option three in our universe. Right? And that is, of course, the best option of the, of the three. So what is nothing? For many years, humankind has believed that nothing is nothing. What is nothing? Many people will say nothing is empty space, a vacuum, space with nothing in it. But empty space or a vacuum isn't nothing. What is it? It's space. And space is not nothing. Space was created during the Big Bang. It had to be created. It wasn't there just for being there. And continues to be created as the universe ever continues to expand. Space is being created even today, as the Big Bang is still expanding. Prior to the Big Bang, not even space existed. There was only a single point, a singularity. And now you can, of course, ask, if the universe is expanding, there where the frontier of the creation of space is going, what's beyond that? More space? No, there's no space. Our universe has an end. What happens when you get to the end? You bump into no space. <laughs> there was only the single point, the singularity, not a point lost somewhere in vast empty space, just a point without any space around it. Neither was there time. If there's no space, there's no time. Time does not make sense when you have no space. Have you ever conceptualized that? How do we measure time? By moving objects, like a pendulum, like a grandfather's clock, or a quartz crystal in these little watches that we wear, that vibrates, and it needs space to vibrate. So if you have no space, just a point, there's no way of measuring time, because nothing, there's no space to move. So time doesn't exist when you have just a point. It's impossible to measure time when you don't have any space. How do we measure time? With a pendulum, a vibrating quartz crystal, or something similar. All such means of measurement require space. Without space, time does not exist. Hence, there had been no time. Time, listen carefully, before the Big Bang. Time didn't exist. It's undefined, as we say in, in science. Lemaitre said, Once there was a day without a yesterday. Time had a beginning. There was a stage when the clock started to tick. And before that, there was no ticking of any clock. <laughs> According to quantum physics, this is what empty space looks like. Matter and antimatter particles alternate and cancel each other out at lightning speeds. They only appear for fractions of seconds. I'm going to show you a little GIF once again, a little video. It's in slow motion so that you can see what's happening. And it's, the, it's a mathematical model that they have simulated, that they made visible for us. And it looks like that. That's empty space in slow motion. Matter particles and antimatter particles appear for fractions of seconds and cancel one another out. So that's what nothing looks like. Empty space. <laughs> That's the stuff that bends if you put a large mass close to it. We live on a blue planet in the Goldilocks zone of our solar system. In a Goldilocks universe governed by Goldilocks laws. What do we mean by Goldilocks? Just right, in the sweet spot, between extremes. Not too hot, not too cold, not too hard, not too soft, not too big, not too small. Just the way Goldilocks found it at the house of the three bears. 
We've already seen that we live in a Goldilocks universe, a flat universe, where everything goes and will go just right, even for millions of years to come. But there's more. Moreover, the Earth's orbit around the Sun is in the so-called Goldilocks zone. Not so close to the Sun as Mercury, where it is so hot that the Sun would scorch us, nor so remote from the Sun as Neptune, where it is so cold that everything would be frozen. In other words, if you look at that picture, the Goldilocks zone is that green band that runs around the Sun. In that zone, everything is fine. We have temperatures that we can live by. If you go closer to the sun, it's so hot you can't live there. If you go further away from the sun, it's so cold you can't live there. And the Earth's orbit is in the Goldilocks zone. Just right, between extremes. No, we live on a blue planet with lots of water in liquid phase. That is, neither the solid state, which we call ice, nor the gas state, which we call steam. A planet able to sustain carbon-based life as we know it, and sufficiently large to possess enough gravity to retain its oxygen-rich atmosphere. If the Earth didn't have enough gravity, our atmosphere would just drift away into space, and we wouldn't be able to breathe. If the Earth was smaller, it wouldn't have enough gravity to do that. That's what happened to Mars. Mars had an at atmosphere in the remote uh, past, but much of it, because the planet is so small, it didn't have enough gravity to retain its, its atmosphere, and very little of it is left there. They can fly the hovercraft there today, the Americans have put it there, but it, it's very difficult to fly because the air is so thin on Mars. And the cherry on top, our universe is governed by Goldilocks laws. Did you know that? Number one, the rate at which the Big Bang expanded was just right in order to produce galaxies. And if galaxies never existed, we wouldn't exist. If this rate would have been slower, all matter would have condensed into a black hole. And had it been too quick, it would have overpowered the gravity of galaxies and they would have never formed, but would have driven apart. Our Sun and its planets would then have never formed, and neither would we. If Newton's gravitational constant in his law of gravity, if that capital G would have been greater than the accepted value that we know it is today, 6.6743 times 10 to the power minus 11 meters cubic per kilogram per second square, then nuclear reactions in the centers of stars would have been so rapid that the life expectancy of stars would have been extremely short, too short, to facilitate the development of carbon-based life. That's us. So that value had been set by God just right so that we could be here. And has it been smaller, then stars would never have been hot enough to host nuclear reactions and we would have had no sun. Because that's why the sun shines, because there's a lot of nuclear reactions going on in the sun. If electromagnetic forces would increase with a mere one part in 10 to the power of 40, which is a very, very small charm, then this main sequence of stars, in which stars spend most of their lives, did you know that stars also have lives, they have very, very long lives, then that would have consisted almost entirely of red stars, which are too cold to produce or sustain life. They would also never explode as supernovae, and supernovae are the carbon factories of the universe, and life as we know it depends on carbon. That's where our Earth's carbon comes from. And if electromagnetic forces were to be somewhat weaker, then all the main sequence stars would have been much too hot turning into blue stars with relatively short lifespans, and once again we wouldn't have been here. Number four. The so-called strong and weak nuclear forces are responsible for the origin of large quantities of carbon in stars. A 10% change, very small change, in those forces would have rendered this impossible. Five. The famous Austrian physicist Ludwig Boltzmann 
It calculated that in order to produce an ordered universe like ours by means of mere random flukes, it would take 10 to the power 10, and my word processor couldn't add another power, so I wrote it out, 10 to the power 10 to the power 80 years, that's a 1 followed by 10 to the power 80 zeros, to occur. So many years. And our universe is but a mere 13.8 billion years, that's 138 followed by 8 zeros old. What does that mean, child of God? That means that if creation took place by random flukes, we are here much, much, much too soon. <laughs> it would have taken much, much longer for us to come to life. What does that tell you? It didn't happen that way. <laughs> it's not by chance that we are here. On this matter, the American astronomer George Greenstein expressed his thoughts. Listen to what he says. It's almost poetry. As we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some or other supernatural agency, or rather agency with a capital letter, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being. Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? In science, the above mental framework is known as the anthropic principle. The English-American theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson puts it this way. As we look out into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy that have worked together for our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe must in some sense have known that we were coming. It was expecting us. The American physicist James Treffel expresses it beautifully. He says the following. But we are living on an insignificant speck of rock, going around an undistinguished star in a low-rent section of a galaxy. We are not the center of the universe. Maybe so, but we are special. But we share our biochemistry with millions of life forms, from flatworms up. We are one member of a large family of animals using one particular variant of carbon chemistry known as DNA. Maybe so, but we are special. Why? Because only on this insignificant speck of rock have beings evolved who can look at the universe and ask the question, why? It's the only place in the entire universe that we know of that that has happened. The problem of reverse extrapolation. Some of you know the term extrapolation, what's that? One person, okay. Let's just explain. Scientists use the term interpolation and extrapolation in order to make intelligent guesses in areas where data gaps exist after experiments. For instance, let's make a, a, a kind of a mind experiment quickly, something we did at school. You take a beaker of water, you put it on a Bunsen flame, you put a thermometer in it. And say you started at zero degrees Celsius, then of course the flame heats the water, temperature goes up and you read it from the thermometer. And maybe your teacher told you, take a reading every half a minute. Every 30 seconds, you take a reading on the thermometer. And then at home, you're going to draw a graph of what you've got. So what does the thermometer do? It goes zero degrees Celsius, one, two, three, up, uh, no, no, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. But now, while you're busy, 
your buddy comes and he says, uh, what did the teacher say? How does this work? And you start to explain to him and you miss a couple of readings. And then you have another few that you take and then somebody else comes and, and uh, interferes and, and you miss another couple of readings and in the end you, you have the last couple as well. Then you go home and you draw your graph. But now you have some readings in your table that are missing. What do you do? You interpolate and you extrapolate. Those, that, those points that aren't there, you say they must have been there. Now you draw your graph. And you've missed the last couple, couple of readings and you say to yourself, they must be there. I've got here, uh, it, it looks like a straight line that this graph forms. There are a couple of missing items there, but I'm going to draw the line just through the ones that I have. So the temperature goes 0 degrees, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 90 100, 110, 120, 160. What's the problem? Some of you shake your heads. We all know water doesn't behave like that. We know that it forms a straight line up to where? To 100 degrees. And if you draw the line further than, than the way it was doing before, you're wrong. Because you didn't expect that at 100 degrees, the graph goes flat. Why? Because the water starts to boil. It stays at the same temperature all the time, and the water evaporates into steam. And there's a phase change that's taking place. But you never expected that because you're inexperienced. <laughs> and that is the danger of extrapolation. Let's see quickly what we mean by that. There's a graph that missed some points. That is interpolation. Interpolation means I have some data points before and I have some data points afterwards and I can simply connect them the way they seem to behave before and the way they seem to behave afterwards. Interpolation is a, is a rather safe method of guessing. But that is extrapolation. Now you have only data points on one end of your new line that you are drawing and you don't have points on the other end. You're just guessing. Mm -hmm. It's a dangerous thing to do. And you can extrapolate that way as well. That's the one we did just now in our little experiment. And that is dangerous. Because it looks as if it will just continue in a straight line. Why would it stop at, at 100 degrees? You don't know. And if you didn't look on your thermometer what happens, you wouldn't know that it starts to behave quite differently at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now we understand what is extrapolation. Naturally, no data points concerning the expansion of the universe. Listen very, very carefully because this is the crux of this whole lecture. I'm going to read it again. Naturally, no data points concerning the expansion of the universe exist for the time before Hubble. Why do I say that? Because Hubble was the first guy who looked. He was the first guy who observed the expansion. When was that? We had the date on screen last night. That was 1929. It's less than a hundred years ago. That was the first time ever anybody looked. And since that time, for the last almost 100 years, we have data points because they monitored it since the days of Hubble very, very carefully. But before that time, we don't have any data points. Nobody looked. Since Hubble had observed this expansion for the first time, astronomers have closely monitored this phenomenon. But everything that was inferred concerning the time before Hubble was done by reverse extrapolation. Because nobody looked. Intelligent guesses were made by applying the laws of nature in reverse gear. In other words, reverse extrapolation was applied. Why would this be a problem? 
Well, the first problem is this. Whenever the assumption is made that since the Big Bang, time has passed linearly or evenly, then this reverse extrapolation necessarily implies a starting point or singularity. That's what we spoke about last night. This, whilst the true available data, really offers us only this. On the right hand side of the picture, that's the only true data we really have and that's just a hundred years. The rest that lies backward, we've guessed, applying the laws in reverse gear. And this singularity causes major problems for scientists. Firstly, where did the enormous quantity of energy come from to make this ultra-dense, ultra-heavy point explode with so much force? After almost a hundred years, science still offers us no credible answer for this question. Secondly, since all distances are zero and all time values zero at this point, all mathematical equations break down at this point. You actually divide by zero. This messes up mathematical equations. The truth is that between these two points, the left-hand side picture and the right-hand side picture, lie scores of intelligent guesswork, reverse extrapolation and assumptions. Because nobody looked. Nobody was there to look. The most important unproved assumption is that time, listen very, very carefully, had, except for the very first few seconds, transpired linearly and evenly during this period. Look at me quickly. We are used to time passing at 24 hours per day. Our whole life was like that. We know nothing else. But if you say today to me, even time is going to do that for millions of years to come, or, if you would say, time has always done that for million years, millions of years before, then you're guessing. Because you weren't there, nobody looked. <laughs> and is that real? If there were somebody to look, would they have found the same that you are alleging? A survey of the world of higher dimensions. If any entity in a one-dimensional universe, and now, now you've got to concentrate, now it becomes really complicated. <laughs> if any entity in a one-dimensional universe, what is a one-dimensional universe? It's a line. Would position itself at any point on the x-axis and were to keep its x-coordinate constant, then it would remain stationary, it cannot move. So there's one point, called the, let's call, call the point John, he sits at the value of 3 on the x-axis. And you say to him, John, your x-value must remain constant, forever. What can John do on, in his universe, his line? He can't go anywhere, because any other position has another value. He must stay just there. It, it sounds quite stupid to say that now, but it becomes very, very complicated very, very fast. So let's do the, the stupid things. In a one-dimensional world, a line, it works like this. If we consider a specific point on that line, say for instance at the value of 3, and for whatever reason we wouldn't allow the point x's value to change, then the point must remain just where it is, for obvious reasons. It cannot move elsewhere since every other position on the line possesses a different x value. If any entity, and now we move to two dimensions, if any entity in a two dimensional universe would position itself at any point on the x axis and were to keep its x coordinate constant, then it would have an entire line of moving space at its disposal. What are we talking about? Let's explain. Hence, if we'd consider a point in a two-dimensional world, a plane, say again, for example, at point 3 on the x-axis, and once again we won't allow its 
x value to change, then that point could move along the length of a whole line in one dimension without changing its value. Let's look at it. If I put the point there, what is its x value? Three. What's its y value now? One. There? Two. X value is still three, y value is two. X value is three, y value is three. But the x value, do you see, remains constant. I can even move it there. X value is still three, y value is minus one. And the minus two, minus three, but the x value remains constant all the time. And it can move in that yellow line. It has a whole line of movement in two dimensions where it can move. So, when we had one dimension, a line, and we said to John, stay where you are at point three, he had only naught dimensions to move in. That means no space. When you go to two dimensions, a plane, and we say to him, John, keep your x value constant, he has a line, one dimension, in which he can move. Are you with me still? So let's move to three dimensions. If any entity in a three-dimensional universe would position itself at any point on the x-axis and were to keep its x-coordinate constant, then it would have an entire plane of moving space at its disposal. So, when we consider a point in the three-dimensional world as space, once again at point three on the x-axis, and we won't allow its x-value to change, then that point can move around an entire plane, three dimensions, without changing its x-value. Let's look at it. We're going to build a little cube first so we can orientate ourselves to where we are, and then we're going to remove the front part so we can see what's going on inside. There's our point. What is its x value now? Three. Its y value is one. Its z value is one. But its x value is three. If I move it there, its x value is still three. Its y value is two. And its z value is one. If I go there, its x value is still 3, its y value is 2, and its z value is 2. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Right. So it can move in that entire yellow plane, keeping its x value constant all the time. So let's look at what we have. In one dimension, moving space of north dimensions. In two dimensions, a plane, moving space of a line, one dimension. In three dimensions, moving space of a plane, two dimensions. So it's always moving space, one dimension less than we are working in. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Right. So can we move to four dimensions? Mm -hmm. Now you ask yourself, even where are you heading with this? <laughs> Why must the x value stay the same? You'll see just now. Is method in the madness. So, if any entity in a four-dimensional universe would position itself at any point on the x-axis and were to keep its x-coordinate constant, then it would have an entire space to move in at its disposal. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. We are working in four dimensions now. Now, if you keep your x value constant, you have an, an entire space, three dimensions, to move in. Since we who are trapped in three dimensions can hardly fathom this situation spatially, we will try to explain it in this way. On the x-axis, we find infinitely many of those planes that we've just discussed. We can find such a plane at literally every point on the x-axis. We can illustrate it as follows. We add that. Let's just make that one plane now bigger. There's another plane like that. If a point would move around on that, its x value would remain constant. Do you agree? Just a little less than 3. 
and there's another one, and there's another one, and there's another one, and there's another one. And, and on every such a plane, the x value of a point would remain the same. Do you agree? Now, suppose that our system of axes represents not only three, but four dimensions. I can't draw it for you, but I, because I'm also trapped in the three dimensions. But let's make our x-axis the fourth dimension, that is the time axis. So what do you have to do now? You have to look just at this part of the picture. And forget about this part of the picture. You ju look just at the x-axis, which now is the time axis. And you imagine for yourself that there are three more axes on this side. We don't know exactly how it's going to look because we are trapped. But we're going to look at that part. Right. Then each plane represents not a mere two-dimensional plane, but an entire three-dimensional space. How big is such a space? It could be as big as our universe. What does that mean? And within every such space, the time value remains constant. This means in such a space, time stands still. You can move around in that space wherever you want to go. You can take your car, drive from Cape Town to Johannesburg, and you arrive in Johannesburg at exactly the same time that you left off in Cape Town. There's no passage of time in between because the time value, the x value, remains constant in a space. Let's have it sink in for a moment. On the time axis lie an infinite number of three-dimensional spaces. Within every such space, each of which might be, say, as large as our own universe, the time value remains constant. In other words, time stands still. Within every such universe, you can move around without any passage of time. Child of God, look at me. What are we talking about? We are talking about eternity. Eternity is not time going on linearly forever. Eternity is time standing still. Be sure not to be trapped in a mathematics class on that day because the bell will never ring. <laughs> never. <laughs> the class will go on and on and on forever because there is no passage of time. In other words, within every such three-dimensional universe, everything happens at once. And whenever all things happen simultaneously, the whole concept of causality, once again, gets compromised. Nothing can cause something else to happen because there is no passage of time in between. The cause and the effect. <laughs> 